I'm going to start out today by reading you a letter. As I read this letter to you, I want to invite you to just monitor what kinds of thoughts and feelings you have. What kind of conclusions you begin to draw as I read this letter. Just pay attention. What's going on inside your head and your heart as you hear this letter? Dear husband, I'm writing you this letter to tell you that I'm leaving you for good. I've been a good woman to you for seven years and I have nothing to show for it. These last two weeks have been hell. Your boss called to tell me that you quit your job today, and that was the last straw. Last week, you came home and didn't notice that I had gotten my hair and nails done, cooked your favorite meal, and even wore a brand new negligee. You came home and ate in two minutes, went straight to sleep after watching the game. You don't tell me that you love me anymore. You don't touch me or anything. Either you're cheating or you don't love me anymore. Whatever the case is, I'm gone. P.S. If you're trying to find me, don't. Your brother and I are moving away to West Virginia together. Have a great life, your ex-wife. Just, just become aware of what kind of thoughts, what kind of feelings are going through you as you hear this. And he writes back. I keep monitoring those thoughts and feelings. Dear ex-wife, nothing has made my day more than receiving your letter. It's true that you and I have been married for seven years, although a good woman is a far cry from what you've been. I watch sports so much to try to drown out your constant nagging. Too bad that doesn't work. I did notice when you cut off all of your hair last week, the first thing that came to mind was you look just like a man. My mother raised me not to say anything if you can't say anything nice. When you cooked my favorite meal, you must have gotten me confused with my brother because I stopped eating pork seven years ago. I went to sleep on you when you had on that new negligee because the price tag was still on it. I prayed that it was a coincidence that my brother had just borrowed $50 from me that morning, and your negligee was $49.99. After all this, I still loved you and felt that we could work it out. So when I discovered that I'd hit the lotto for $10 million, I quit my job and bought us two tickets to Jamaica. But when I got home, you were gone. Everything happens for a reason, I guess. I hope you have the filling life you always wanted. My lawyer said, with your letter that you wrote, you won't get a dime from me. So take care. P.S. I don't know if I ever told you this, but Carl, my brother, was born Carla. I hope that's not a problem. Signed, richer than you'll ever be and free too. Interesting letters. Now, do you see what just happened in your mind? He's a bad guy. She's a bad person. No, she's a good person. He's a bad guy. No, he's bad. no, he's a good guy. Well, they're judging each other through this whole thing. We're coming to one of the most powerful things I could ever teach anybody today. It changed my life when I learned this concept. I'm practicing. You know how doctors and attorneys practice? I'm practicing learning to be non-judgmental. But we're going to talk about judgment. Jesus has some things to say about it. If you get this concept, we're going to study the law of judgment today. As you look at this law, it is a spiritual law. My belief, the way I see life, is I believe that you are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Therefore, you're under the jurisdiction of 
physical, biological law. That's your body. You're under psychological law. That's your soul. You're under spiritual law. You think about gravity. Gravity is a very, very powerful law. If you get further and further away from this earth, gravity loses its power. It's a physical law. You can go to Mars. You can go to the next solar system. And you'll find that judgment is a spiritual law that never loses its power. You think about if you take your pen, your pencil, somehow you throw it out of an airplane at 40,000 feet, gravity is going to start bringing it down. It may take several minutes for it to finally hit the earth, but it's coming down. It's not going to fall up. It's going to fall down because of a law. Law, the law of judgment says we practice what we judge others for. So we think about this. I'm going to read the scripture to you, start in Matthew 7. We're only doing five verses today. Now, we're in the middle of a study of the Sermon of the Mount. I like to refer to it as the best of Jesus. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. We've, we're we're through, through two-thirds of it. We're coming into the final chapter here. And Jesus is on a roll. He says in Matthew 7, 1, Judge not that you not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This guy named Oswald Chambers, he weighs in on this. He wrote a book called My Utmost for His Highest. Or is it the other way? His Utmost for My Highest? Something like that, yeah. Really good book. It's one of those books I can do about a page at a time. That's enough for one day. He's heavyweight. He says this. Tolerating a wrong attitude toward another person causes you to follow the spirit of the devil. No matter how saintly you are, one carnal judgment of another person only serves the purposes of hell in you. Bring it immediately into the light and confess, oh Lord, I've been guilty there. If you don't, your heart will become hardened through and through. One of the penalties of sin is our acceptance of it. It is not only God who punishes sin, but sin establishes itself in the sinner and takes its toll. No struggling or praying will enable you to stop doing certain things. And the penalty of sin is that you gradually get used to it until you finally come to the place where you no longer even realize it is sin. Jesus says, judge not. I'm going to flip over to Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Paul chimes in. He says, therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself. Because you, the judge, practice the very same things. In his extremely useful book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Dr. Stephen Covey tells a story of being on a subway in New York City on a Sunday morning. You know how it is on a subway in New York City. It's usually a real zoo in there. But he said this Sunday morning, it was peaceful. It was serene. The subway was moving along, people reading their newspapers, they're reading their books. Some had just closed their eyes, their hands in their lap. They're just relaxing as the train moves along, shuffling a little side to side, a little bit of vibration coming through. It was just peaceful until it stopped and a man and two children got on the subway. The man sat, sat down next to Dr. Covey. 
And he closed his eyes and he slumped down a little and he kind of sighed and he just sat there. And these kids started running wild. They were yelling. They were throwing things. They were grabbing people's newspapers. They thought that was great. Somebody's lost in their paper and all of a sudden this hand comes and snatches their paper away. They were out of control. Dr. Covey is sitting there and does his very best to be patient, but finally he decides he's going to take responsibility and speak to this person for being so totally insensitive to everybody else on the subway. And he says, sir, do you realize your children are disturbing other people? Is it possible that you could control them a little bit more? When the man opened his eyes and kind of looked around, it's like he was just becoming aware suddenly of what's actually going on. And he says in a soft voice back to Dr. Covey, I think you're probably right. We just left the hospital where their mother died an hour ago. And I don't know what to think. They obviously don't know how to handle it. He judged this man, and I would have done the same thing. I do the same thing. But he judged this man not knowing the story, not knowing what was going on with him. When he found out, he realized he was the one who had actually been insensitive. An innocent thing like that with no ill intentions, he practiced what he judged somebody else for doing being insensitive. So Matthew 7, Jesus says, judge not. Romans 2, 1 says, don't judge others. When you judge others, the NIV says, you bring condemnation down on your things, yourself, the very things you judge others for, you practice yourself. This law and my ignorance of it crushed me many times. After three really good, fine seminaries, some of the best on the planet, still didn't understand this law of judgment. It was never taught in seminary. It took a mentor, Dr. Henry Malone, who was in deliverance ministry, who wrote, wrote a book called Shadow Boxing. And he taught me about judgment and how it works. I was still grappling with it. I thought, you know, I'm having trouble. Sometimes God answers us. At the strangest times, I've had multiple answers from God that have come years after I've been asking questions. Sometimes he doesn't answer immediately. He's probably waiting for me to be ready to hear the answer. And one Sunday morning, I was driving east on Interstate 30, cruising along 60, 70 miles an hour, and God decides to explain judgment to me. He said, remember Perry Mason. Well, I grew up with Perry Mason as a child. He said, look at the judges in the courtroom. What are they trying to do? The judge needs to do three things. Number one, there's got to be a motive. Why would somebody do something wrong? What is their motive? What are they thinking? What are they feeling? Why would they have done that? So motive is one thing a judge does. Second thing, he has to determine, are they innocent or guilty of a crime? Third thing, he has to determine what they're punishment will be. If we do any one or all of these three things, we're judging someone. Now that's tricky business. You think about it. Scripture tells us when they were thinking about David becoming the king, God said, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We don't know what other people are going through. We don't know what other people think and feel. And if they tell you what they think and feel, it could be very different five to ten seconds from now. You know how we people are. We don't know. But when we think we know why somebody is the way they are, we have judged them. There's a very fine line. You've probably got questions in your mind going, well, what if people are just doing something wrong? There's no question about it. Well, there is question about it. You can evaluate behavior without judging person. But the line is when you cross from behavior to character. Let me give you an example. We've got couple A, a man and a woman. Couple B, a man and a woman. Mrs. A and Mr. B hook up. 
and they have an affair. And it becomes common knowledge, and it's documented because each of their spouses hired private investigators, and they got photos. And this is kind of flying around. Everybody knows they committed the act of adultery. But what if I say, oh, yeah, you heard about A and B. They got together. They're adulterers. That is a judgment because I'm talking about their character. What if God said, hmm, you might not be aware that three days ago they had real genuine experiences with me and they were sincerely convicted of their sin. They repented. They went to their own spouses. They got on their hands and their knees. They cried. They repented. They offered to do anything to save the marriage and said, I will be 100% accountable 24-7 until you don't want me to be anymore. I have forgiven them. I have removed their sin as far as the east is from the west. As far as though their sins be as scarlet, I've made them white as snow and I remember their sin no more. So you're accurate if you say they committed the act of adultery. But you're inaccurate if you call them adulterers. They were three days ago. They're not anymore. This is a tough issue. I grapple. I get the but gods. You ever get the but gods? But God, they did this and this and this and this and this. Don't judge. But God, they did this and this and this. Don't judge. Leave it alone. See, that judge has a full-time job. And you probably have more than enough going on in your life right now. You can give yourself a break. A lot of us are judgmental somewhere close to 24-7. We don't mean to be, but we've become accustomed to it. The average person's thinking 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day, roughly one per second. And when we see somebody doing something we don't like, we can go to that judgment so fast. We think, well, don't they think they're hot stuff? Oh, they think they can get away. Oh, they think. When you start saying they think or they feel, that is a judgment. We don't know and we can't know. Well, God gave me that lesson from Perry Mason of three things that define judgment, but he wasn't through with me yet. He said, just imagine you go down to the Luce Garrett County Courthouse for jury duty another time. I've been down there many times. You walk into the jury room. It's huge. You feel like cattle being herded through. Seats three to four hundred people. Just imagine you get there, and as always, they don't start on time. They told you you have to be here. By the, and then they waste another hour or so while they're getting ready behind the scenes. And you're sitting there, you're unhappy. I, I just might have an inkling of, well, I'm tired of this. I'll entertain these people. And I walk around the bench and sit down at the judge's bench behind it pick up the gavel, look at it, act like I'm going to pound it down, put it down, smile at the people, put my feet up on the bench. Well, about this time, just imagine the bailiff walks in and he's about to say, all rise for the honorable judge late. And he sees me. He's probably going to say, sir, you need to get out of that chair immediately. If the judge sees you there, he has the right and the privilege to find you for contempt of court. And if you're not gracious, he'll probably have me take you straight to jail across the street. And God said, don't sit in my seat. God is the only one who has all the facts all the time. He's outside of time and space. He always knows all of the past, the present, and the future. He's the only one equipped to judge. So as we look at this, you're going to see that your life will radically change if you give up judgment. Three things will happen for you. You'll notice that things you haven't been able to accomplish, suddenly you're able to accomplish. Things you've been trying to quit that you haven't been able to, they'll be easier for you to move away from. I've studied people. I've worked with people as a psychologist since, gosh, 1985, coming up on I guess that would be, what, how many years is that? Y'all can do the math. I lost numbers in the wreck, sorry. Long time, close to 40 years. And I look at that, and so many times I could have a full-time practice 
doing nothing and saying, okay, tell me what's not working in your life. And then we'll figure out who you judged in those areas. It's amazing. It is law. When we judge others, we end up practicing the same things. Now, there are variations. Can't tell you how many people I've worked with that have struggled with alcohol, with drugs, with being workaholics that have addictive personalities. And so often we find out that they grew up with alcoholic parents. And they hated, hated that their parents were alcoholics. They vowed they'd never become an alcoholic, but because they judged their parents, they are destined. They have brought condemnation on themselves, and the demons make them practice what they judge their parents for. This kind of stuff happens. It's difficult not to judge. But the best thing is just think the way God tells us to think. Think about the good stuff. So if you stop judging, you're going to three, see three things in this passage. You can stop doing what you don't want to do, and you can start doing more successfully what you do want to do. The second thing, you can eliminate a lot of pain for yourself. And the third thing is God will give you more discernment. Back to the scripture here. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. With the measure used, it will be measured to you. That means you're going to do what you've judged others for. This is just how it works. This cost me a lot. I grew up in a wonderful home, godly parents, fully committed to God. They were together 50 years. My father died at 75. My mother died at 85. But I grew up judging divorced people. Just did. I judged them. I thought, how could anybody stand at this altar with somebody they're supposedly in love with, make those vows in the sight of God in the presence of these witnesses, and then just decide, you know, 5, 10, 20 years down the road, I don't think I want to be with you anymore. I found somebody better. I'm out of here. I just didn't understand it. Didn't get it. Of course, I'd never been married. Have you ever noticed that so many times the experts about child rearing and marriage have not been married? They don't know what it's like. They don't know how hard it is, but I was judgmental. Well, I dodged that bullet, I think, but keep in mind, this is a spiritual law that will override psychological and physical law. My first marriage, I did everything right. Both of us were virgins when we got married. She was 22. I was 28. Neither one of us knew what we were doing because we had never done it before. And we were together for nine and a half years in holy matrimony. And I didn't want to be divorced, but she made it impossible for me to stay at the ch big, big, big church where I was and uh, had to go. Well, I got an annulment after nine and a half years. And People ask me, how many times you've been married? Well, once or twice. Well, don't you know? Well, it's a matter of interpretation. The law says the first one didn't count because it was legally annulled. Well, how do you do that? Well, in Rockwall County with Judge Bosworth, if it clears the docket and it makes both parties happy, I think we could do that for you today. And they did. Three years later, I was in love with somebody else and we got married. Three years after that, I was not a good husband. I, my mistress was not a person. It was ministry. I was starting a church. I was just an absentee husband. She got interested in the 30-year-old across the street. Well, in June, she filed for divorce. Late in July, she told me she had filed for divorce. Later in August, she kind of hid some things from me along the way. It was over, and by October, she was married to the guy across the street, and I was divorced. Now, that was decades in the making. That was a long, slow process, but the law of judgment held true. I was skinny all of my life, up through college, couldn't gain weight. I thought if I ever got to 175 pounds, I'd look like Hercules. 
And I think I'll probably never see 175 again. It's so far behind me. I don't know that I'll ever get down to that again. And I was out jogging one day. I was running up Live Oak Street. There were some empty storefronts. It was dark inside. Those plate glass windows made a wonderful mirror. And I'm jogging by, and I've got Dunlop's disease. You know where it's Dunlopped over? It's similar to Chester drawers disease, where your chest falls down into your drawers. I was running along. I was jogging. I, you know, I was bouncing. Wasn't used to that. Looked at, looked in this mirror. I thought, suck in. And I couldn't suck in enough anymore. It was gone. And God, I think, smiled at me. Said, mm hmm been judging some of my heavier children, haven't you? Well, yeah, God, they don't care. Yeah, God, they won't stay on their diet. Yeah, God, they won't, they won't work out. All of that judgment, I'm determining why they are overweight. He says, mm-hmm, this law of judgment's going to get you because you're going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until you repent of judging my other children. And before I got home, I was repenting. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Shortly thereafter, the weight started falling off, and I've had very little. Well, it's it's an effort now to keep it off, but I can do it. And every now and then I get a little bit judgmental, and God says, What are you doing? <laughs> judging somebody and he says you know what's going to happen don't you mm -hmm. the thing i struggle with the most now is judging stupid people oh my gosh and since the wreck i've been pretty stupid it happens often it's caught up with me there's always something but when we stop judging others it's much easier for us not to do those same things that we have judged them for. We judge things we don't like. That's because we focus on those. God says, don't focus on what you don't like in people. Focus on what's good about them. There's something good about everybody. And you can find that. But stop judging, and it's going to set you free. The second thing, you're going to avoid a whole lot of pain. As Jesus goes on here, he starts talking about this. He says, why do you look at the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? This is parabolic. This is hyperbole. It's overstatement. You really, your eye's too small to have a whole big log in it. But it's a pretty good picture because you think about fireplace logs, not Duraflame logs that are in a nice slick, nice package, but real logs. They're nearly always dirty. That bark is constantly discriminated. There are a lot of specks that come from it. And can you imagine just somebody touching your eyeball with a log and that debris sticking to your moist eye? It's going to be incredibly painful. He said, stop worrying about the speck in somebody else's eye and deal with your own pain. It's nearly impossible to be in a relationship with a human being and not judge them. They can be a casual friend, an intimate relationship. We tend to judge. Jesus says, don't. Deal with your own pain. Get that log, that board, that plank that moat, however it's translated in your Bible. Get it out of your own eye. Deal with your own stuff. And then something happens. Discernment comes. When you deal with your own stuff, then you can see clearly to get the speck out of your brother's eye. You can help somebody get it out. Don't come at them with pliers. Don't come at them with tweezers to get something out of their eye, but maybe with the tissue, something very soft, moist, that won't harm them anymore. You can help them get it out. See, back in these days, 2,000 years ago, they didn't have mirrors like we have. They certainly didn't have magnifying mirrors. They didn't have phones and iPads you could look through and expand things and really get a microscopic view of things. They could look, they knew what they looked like. They could look in the water. They could look on highly polished things and see some, but not enough to get a speck out of their eye. We need each other to do that. We can help each other. There's a difference between 
discernment, and judgment. My friend Ann Albers, who lives in Phoenix, interesting person. Before she was 40 years old, she worked for Honeywell, and she was supervising 40 of their engineers. She was coordinating another 100 engineers. Those are usually pretty smart people. Very successful young lady. Her dad was a physicist. She was an engineer, thriving career. 9-11-2001, God said, leave engineering and spend the rest of your life talking to the angels. Well, I found Anne when I was doing research, working on a, a doctoral project, a dissertation. She'd written a book about Jesus. It was interesting. I contacted her and said, hey, I'm willing to buy your paperback book because that was all that was for sale. They didn't have Kindle then. I said, but is there any way I could purchase the electronic copy for you? I'm working on a dissertation, and I'd like to use some of your information. She said, oh, my goodness, if you're a student, I'll send you an autographed copy of the book for free, and I'll send this electronic copy of the manuscript to you immediately so you can search exactly for what you want on your computer. That's how we got to be friends. She has some interesting things to say to us about the difference between judgment and discernment, which Jesus mentions both of those. I want to read to you her thoughts. Judgment says he or she should not think, act, or speak in this fashion. Discernment says I do not want to be around him or her when he, she thinks, acts, or speaks in this fashion. Judgment tries to change another. Discernment tells you what is healthy for you. Judgment shows areas in which you require another to change to feel good about yourself or your own decisions. Discernment shows you have matured enough spiritually to own your choices and to move away from that which is not healthy. We look at scripture again in John, the seventh chapter. Verse 24, it says, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right or righteous judgment. How are you going to do that? You're going to have to have the mind of Christ, the heart of God, and knowledge of the scripture. You can judge behavior without judging character. You can evaluate behavior. You can say, that's in disagreement with God's word. I don't want to do that. Or I'm going to do this because that's what God says. You don't have to judge people's character. Judge with righteous judgment, not by appearances. There's a 24-year-old boy. I read you this story. 24-year-old boy seeing out from the train's window, riding along in the train with his dad, looking out the window. And he shouts, Dad, look, the trees are going behind as the train zipped by them. Dad smiled and a young couple sitting nearby looked at the 24-year-old's childish behavior with pity. Suddenly again, he exclaimed, Dad, look, the clouds are running with us. The couple couldn't resist and said to the old man, why don't you take your son to a good doctor. The old man smiled at them and said, I did. And we're just coming from the hospital. My son was blind from birth. He just got his eyes today. Appearances are so totally, completely misleading. We don't know what's going on in other people's life. We don't know why they're acting the way we do. We think, well, at this age, they should know better. They may know better, but they may have extenuating circumstances, and they just can't pull it off sometimes. But if we judge them, we're going to be judged the same way. If we judge them, we're keeping that log in our own eye. We're extending our our, our own pain. And if we judge them, we're not going to get the discernment that comes from seeing clearly when we get our own stuff dealt with. 
Well, should you never see faults in people's lifestyles? I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. He said, deal with your own stuff and recognize that your stuff is bigger than their little stuff. Because you know about all of your stuff. You know only about a little bit of their stuff. So recognize your stuff is bigger. And once you've dealt with that, that's probably going to humble you. Then you can go to them graciously and talk with them and help them if they're living a lifestyle and doing things that will not benefit them. It's not saying you can't talk to somebody about their problems, but you'll probably need to wait until they're ready to hear it. And in the meantime, you can get all of those logs out of your own eye. Makes a big difference. There's another scripture we're going to look at. I'll start wrapping it up with this one. It's really big. Just to take the, the, the thing about judgment from judging others to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in the darkness and will include the purposes of the heart. So you look at that, some translations say, therefore, judge nothing. Don't judge anything at all. Let me give you a story that I help, think will help you understand this. Back in the days of Lao Tzu in China, he heard a story, and he'd often share it with other people. It was about an old man in a small village who owned a fabulous white horse. When kings and princes were traveling through his region, they'd take detours to go to his little village to see this white horse. Many people tried to purchase the horse, offered him much more money than it was worth, and he wouldn't sell it. And they said, why not? It would make you wealthy compared to the rest of your village. And he said, that horse is like a friend. That horse is like family. I can't sell him. Not going to. The people of the village would see all the wealthy people. They're trying to buy the horse. And they come around after the kings and princes had left. And they say, oh, man, you need to sell that horse. If you don't, somebody's going to steal him if you don't sell him. And he said, it just wouldn't be right to do. Well, not too long after that. One morning, he got up, went to the stable, and the horse was gone. All the people gathered and said, oh, man, you could have been so wealthy, and now it's too late. Somebody's stolen your horse. And he said, that's judgmental. Let's just look at the fact and say the horse is no longer in the stable. And the people shook their heads and wandered off. Well, 15 days later, they discovered the horse had not been stolen. He had run away into the wild, and when he came back, about 12 other beautiful horses followed him into the corral. The son of the old man saw them in the corral, immediately closed the gate. All the people gathered around and say, what has happened here? He said, well, my, my horse came back and brought these other horses with him. And they said, oh, you are so blessed. You're so for Now you're wealthy. You're set for the rest of your life. And he said, once again, you're being judgmental. We don't know what's a blessing and what's misfortune. We only see a fragment of life. And they went on and on about it. And then they wandered off. About a week later, his son is starting to break these horses one at a time. And he's on a horse. He's in the corral. He's riding the horse. The horse throws him, breaks both of his legs. He's crippled. He's in a hard, hard place. The village gathers. They were so sorry about your son. But, oh, man, this is such misfortune. Now, you don't have anybody to take care of you when you can no longer take care of yourself. We're so sorry for your misfortune. Once again, he says, don't judge. Just say my son's legs are broken, and right now he's crippled. Well, they shook their heads. They wandered off, this crazy old man. A time after that, a war broke out in the land. And the military came through all the small villages, drafting forcibly into the military all of the young men. They took all the young men from this village except the old man's son who was crippled. 
who could not march. They left him there and everybody was in tears and everybody said, you're so fortunate. We'd rather have our children crippled than dead. And we know this is a losing war. We'll probably never, ever see our sons again. And the old man gave them sage advice. Judge not. You only see a small fragment. You don't know if it's a blessing or if it's misfortune. Just say our sons have gone away to war and leave it. That's the fact. That's all you know. That makes such a difference. I read to you again from Ann Albers because she talks about where we are today and how we need to respond appropriately to our temptations to judge people. She says, Dear Prince, I implore you, as the intentions in your world continue to rise, not to fall into judgment. Earth is a school. And they're students at all levels indeed. As I've said before, earth is a one-room schoolhouse. Those of you in the more advanced grades have a responsibility to be in integrity with higher truths so that you can be example for those less evolved. Do not be harsh with yourselves if you slip. Just get up and keep going and resolve to do the best you can. You are eternally challenged to stand in spiritual truth. That you can choose to create a beautiful life for yourself, no matter what lessons that others on the planet participate in. Do not judge yourself or others, dear friends, for judgment is an act of emotional violence. It's the best time, probably in our lives, to become non-judgmental. Because the Republicans and the Democrats are judging each other. They're judging each other's motives. They'd like to punish each other. They've declared the other party guilty of all kinds of things. We're doing it with people. We're doing it with parties. We're doing it with issues. Some people believe in all their hearts that we should take all the immigrants from all the other countries and give them everything they need. Just give it to them. Others are saying, you're going to bankrupt our country. You should do that and you shouldn't let dangerous people come in and people are so judging each other evaluate the facts but don't judge the people it's going to set you free to be and do who you want to be it's going to eliminate much pain in your life and it will give you discernment from god why would God give anybody discernment who's going to use it against the people they're judging? He gives it discernment to the people who are most likely to be loving and help those people become better people. Life is better without judgment.